Brothers and sisters, I would like to ask that you please take out your own copy of the scriptures and you open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 19. One of the elements of storytelling that is almost always able to grab the attention of an audience, it's almost guaranteed to draw them in, is an amazing escape. Because of Hollywood, that's often in recent years been turned into a car chase. Everyone from James Bond to Simba, however, have chase scenes, and they are often heart-poundingly cinematic. In 1 Samuel chapter 19, there are four different occasions in which David escapes from Saul. None of them are chase scenes that you might be used to seeing, but all of them are incredible displays of God's power in protecting David. Last time we were in 1 Samuel, we looked at the first two ways that the Lord delivered David. In verses 1 through 7, we saw Saul gather his war council together, and he informed them that there's now one and only one priority on his national agenda, which is just kill David. Jonathan, Saul's son, who was in the room, boldly but graciously stood up for David he approached his father in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and by the grace of God, Jonathan was able to use common sense and rhetoric to speak some sense into Saul. And Saul responded by swearing, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. That sentiment did not last very long because the very next time we see David in Saul's courts playing music for Saul, trying to help Saul, the king was sitting there with his spear in hand and decided once again to attempt to pin David to the wall. And whether due to being afflicted by an evil spirit or because he was seeing red with anger or maybe because he was not very athletic, Saul once again missed David and David was able to escape. But this is where the chapter begins to ramp up in intensity. Today, we'll just be looking at the third act of God's deliverance that's found in verses 11 through 17. Before we even get to that text, I would ask that you would please join me in prayer, that God would grant us understanding in our minds, and that he would inflame our hearts with love for God and worship as we study this passage together. Let's pray. Our God and Father, I thank you for every sheep that is here today. We thank you, the Lord, that you call your sheep by name, that you draw them into your fold and that you graciously promise to feed them. <clears throat> we thank you, Lord, that the way you feed us is by giving us the scriptures, that it is food for our souls. It nourishes us in our, in our hearts. And Lord, we pray that today, as we come to the word, that you would not leave us expectant, but that you would fill us and that you would give us every bit of nourishment that we need for our walk with you. And so, Lord, I pray that today you would use me, this imperfect messenger, to proclaim a perfect message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the words I say would be true and edifying and beneficial for the people. And, Lord, I pray for every person in this room that they would have ears to hear and hearts to believe what you have to say this morning. We thank you for your word, and, Lord, we pray to, that you would use it right now by your Spirit, to transform us. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. What I want to do is begin by sliding into David's shoes for a minute to begin thinking about this passage from his perspective. What is going on from his vantage point? You see, David is now the most famous man in the entire kingdom. He has killed Goliath. He has saved the nation from their enemies, the Philistines. He is the one who is being sung about by all of these young ladies all around the country. And as a reward for killing Goliath, David was then permitted to marry Michal, Saul's daughter. Now, this was not merely a marriage of convenience. Back in chapter 18, we learn that it says, Michal loved David, and David was willing to fight valiantly and kill 200 Philistines in order to gain her hand in marriage. So it appears as though he actually cares about her as well. Look, David literally has the worst father-in-law in all of history. His wife's father has made it his life's ambition to kill David. Now, although many people joke about having a bad relationship with their in-laws, David really lived it. But imagine what kind of position that put Michal into. Let's think about things from her perspective for a moment. She really loved David. She did. But her father retained the power in the nation. He's the one who's in charge. When Saul saw that Michal loved David, think of what happened to her. He says, you know what I'm going to do? 
I'm going to try to kill David, but if I do it myself, then I'm going to be in trouble with the populace. They're going to be mad at me. So you know what? I will get the Philistines to do the dirty work for me. So he used his daughter as a pawn in his chess game to say, you know what, David? You can marry my daughter, the one that loves you so much. She's all yours if you just go do this impossible task of killing 100 Philistines and bringing back the proof. He thought, surely David will fail, the Philistines will kill him, and all my problems will go away. Think of how he was treating his daughter in that moment. When that didn't work, Saul was forced to keep his promise, and he begrudgingly gave his daughter to David. Now, effectively, this allowed his worst enemy to marry into his own family and become part of the royal household, and even more importantly, into the royal line of succession. Now, Saul doesn't care what his daughter thinks. That's clear. He does not care about her heart. He does not care about what she wants or what she feels. He's literally just going to now send his goons to his daughter's house to put a stake out and invade his own daughter's house in order to assassinate his daughter's husband. That's what we're about to read in the text. So with those family dynamics in mind, let's look at the passage starting in verse 11. It says, Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him, that he might kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, told him, If you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal let David down through the window, and he fled away and escaped. Michal took an image and laid it on the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair at its head and covered it with clothes. And when Saul sent messengers to David, she said, He's sick. Then Saul sent the messengers to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed that I may kill him. And when the messengers came in, behold, the image was in the bed with the pillow of goat's hair at its head. Saul said to Michal, Why have you deceived me thus and let my enemy go so that he has escaped? And Michal answered Saul, He said to me, Let me go. Why should I kill you? Now, there are four main things that I want you to see from this scene. We're going to begin with, let's just examine the plot a little bit more carefully. If you were a Hollywood director, you would read a script like this and say, there's a bunch of plot holes here we need to figure out how to repair. There's a few things that if you were reading this story, they probably won't make a lot of sense on a cursory read. First, you might ask yourself the question, why is Mikal concerned about messengers just hanging around outside their house? Well, the simple answer is that these were not simply an ancient version of a mailman. These were effectively soldiers that were sent to escort David back to Saul by force. And Michal somehow knows Saul's plan. We don't know how. Maybe she was privileged to some information. Maybe somebody tipped her off. Maybe she was listening into a conversation she wasn't supposed to. Or more likely, she just really knew her dad. She knew what Saul was like, and she knew that Saul had sent these men there with a purpose, and that purpose was one of murder. Her plan that she comes up with, well, it probably sounds a little bit ridiculous to you on the surface, uh, but there's a reason for that. Why does it seem so silly? Well, it's because stories are derivative. You may have read many books or seen movies that utilize this trope of somebody's coming in, so let's pretend that somebody's in the bed, we'll put something in there, we'll cover it up, and we'll make it look like they're present. It happens all the time. But Ferris Bueller did not create that kind of a ruse. The reason this plot point seems like it's a well-worn story beat is because Mikal invented it. She has originated one of the most ridiculous but occasionally effective forms of deception that is used in all forms of media. What may not make sense to you, though, is why the messengers simply didn't go in and look. Why didn't they check? Why didn't they just get a closer glimpse to make sure that that thing that looks like goat hair really is just goat hair? Here's a couple possible reasons. One is that rooms in those days were not lit like we have lit rooms. So it would have been much more difficult to see what was going on in the bedroom. Uh, Secondly, When these people are talking about being sick, this is a powerful warrior that is so sick that he's not getting out of bed. 
Ancient people actually understood something about social distancing. No, ancient people didn't understand germs like we know them now. They didn't have microscopes or modern science. But they did understand some things. They were not stupid people. And they knew if there was somebody who was very sick and you spend a little bit of time around them, you end up being really sick. And so generally speaking, when there was a very ill person, especially somebody powerful that is brought to their knees with a major illness, you just leave them alone. So it's very possible that they didn't want to get too close because they were concerned that the disease would quickly travel from any person that they contacted. So that's a possibility of why they don't even go look. Uh, But another reason is that think of who this is. This is not just any guy that they were sent to arrest. This is the hero of the nation. This is the guy who went up against Goliath by himself. This is the guy who fearlessly went and fought not just the 100 required Philistines, but 200 Philistines to receive his wife as a bride. And now they're being told, we don't know how many there are, probably a handful, they are being told, I want you to walk into his bedroom and get him. And my guess is these minimum wage workers are not real excited about risking their life for Saul. So that's a possibility as well. It seems increasingly likely that they knew Saul's daughter was lying to them. It's likely that they knew that this image on the bed wasn't really David. And it seems increasingly likely because of just how hilariously this story unfolds. Think about what happens. They go and they tell Saul, he's sick, he's in bed. Listen to what Saul says to them and try not to laugh. He says, bring the entire bed and I will kill him myself. That is insane if it's really David. Now, it's possible that Saul walked over to David's house and then this next part of the scene unfolds there. But that's actually not how the reading of the text looks in Hebrew. And in most translations, not in English either. It actually appears that those messengers returned to David's home, picked up the bed, and carried it back to Saul. And then it says they were coming back into Saul's presence, which means it literally seems that They literally did go and get David. And if that is the case, I am confident that as they are carrying that statue made of wood or stone, they knew for sure that's not a human body. They were not shocked. They were not surprised. But my guess is they weren't really going to start sticking out their neck by accusing the royal princess of treason. Let's just let the family figure it out for themselves. So they come in with this bed with a fake David. Here's the second thing that I want you to see now that we've kind of got the plot in our mind. I want you to think about this statue, this image. Take out your own Bible and look at verse 13 again. Most likely you're going to see a footnote next to the word image. Now if you follow that footnote to the bottom of the page, you will notice that there is a note that probably says something that this word could also be translated as idol or household god. This is not the word in Hebrew that is usually used for idols, but it is the same word that is often translated as household gods. Do you remember in Genesis when Jacob is escaping Laban and Rachel trying to get back at her father for how much he has tricked her husband, she steals her dad's most prized possession. She goes into her father's home and collects his household idols and she takes them with him. And then Laban thinks that it's, of course, Jacob who has robbed him. So he chases him down with soldiers. And then when they get there, they inspect everybody's tents to make sure they're not there. And Rachel, sweating bullets, knows I've got them. So she hides them under herself and then claims that she can't stand up for reasons I won't describe. But in that moment, you see this same exact word. That's the first time we find it in the Bible. It's a teraphim, a household god. And those gods were used for worship. We see the same word used on many occasions where it speaks about household gods throughout the book of Judges. So what in the world is going on here? This is David. He's a worshiper of the one true God. Why is this thing in his bedroom in the first place? Well, there are three main different uh, uh, ways that we can explain this, ways that scholars look at this and give information. 
as all good pastors should do, I will give you the last one as the one that I believe to be true. First, there are some that argue that this was not an idol that was intended to be worshipped. That this was just a statue. It was just an image. It was something that was carved to be beautiful. It doesn't seem to match, for example, the description of household gods. The household gods that that Rachel stole, they were small enough that she could hide a bunch of them underneath of her dress. But this one, this one is big enough that it looks like a real human being. So some look at this and they say, this can't be the same kind of thing that we're talking about because household gods were often small. So this must not be a true teraphim, a true object of worship. Well, it's possible that they're right. It's possible that these scholars are correct. Maybe they are. I don't know. That Maybe like the Greeks and the Romans later would make, this was just a statue for beauty and decoration, a symbol of wealth, a symbol of victory. David certainly was an artistic kind of guy, so it seems possible that he did like having decorative craftsmanship around his room. Maybe that's the case. However, if that is the case then this is literally the only time in the entire Hebrew Bible that this word is ever used to describe anything other than an object of evil worship to a false god. In every other case, there is no dispute that this word represents an object of worship that is a wicked substitute for God himself. So I actually find this explanation a bit unlikely. The second common explanation here is just to blame everything on the wife. It's all Michael's fault, Michal's fault. Why was this statue there? Well, obviously, it's hers. Obviously, David wouldn't do such a thing, so it must be the wife's fault. Michal grew up in a household, for example, that didn't honor God, that didn't love the Lord, so perhaps, maybe, this was something she inherited as a gift for her wedding from someone like her own father. But even if that's true... Consider that David would still be acting sinfully if this was the case. As the head of the household, he would have every right and full responsibility to tell his wife, you cannot bring a false god into our bedroom. So as much as people have attempted to exonerate David with this explanation, this actually does not make it better. In my opinion, this actually makes it worse. Just like Adam should have stopped Eve when she took that fruit and it says that he was with her, If this was her idol, then he should have stopped his wife as well. Before we look at the last option, I think it's important that we pause for a second and we take note of something. Up to this point in 1 Samuel, up to to this point in the story, David has shown himself to be an incredible, nearly messianic figure. In every situation, he has displayed unparalleled trust in the Lord and a commitment to godliness, even in the face of tribulation. If you know your Bible at all, then you know that this image of David is going to be completely shattered when we get to 2 Samuel and David commits adultery with Bathsheba and then she conspires to kill her husband and cover it up. But it's important to understand that David's sin with Bathsheba is not the first time that he ever sinned. In fact, as we make our way through the rest of the book, There are going to be many little hints that David is not flawless. He is not sinless. He is not perfect. He is not Jesus. The third explanation is simply that David was a sinner and he allowed idolatry to somehow slip into his life. Now, perhaps this is Samuel's way to help us see that this is the first of many cracks in David's armor. We're going to see over the next several chapters that he does have some problems with honesty and he does have some problems with sin. Maybe this is just one way that the Bible reminds us that the best of men are men at best. Now, before we move past this point, I want you to take inventory of your own life. Because regardless of which of these three explanations is right, you need to know what is right in your own life? Do you have idols hiding in your bedroom? Have you gone from being victorious over sin like David had been victorious over Goliath only to let wicked practices in through the back door? Idols are insidious. They sneak into our lives in a million ways. They often appear to be a blessing from the Lord himself and oftentimes they actually arrive to us as a blessing from the Lord and then what do we do with them We shift them. We put our affection on them. We turn them to something they should never be, into an idol. Instead of honoring God, the giver, we find a way to dishonor the giver and give all glory to the gift. 
The late great Tim Keller defines idolatry like this in his book, Counterfeit Gods. He said, an idol is anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Whatever controls us is our Lord. The person who seeks power is controlled by power. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by the people he or she wants to please. We do not control ourselves. We are controlled by the Lord of our lives. Idols control us since we feel like we must have them or life is meaningless. The fact of the matter is that there are probably idols in every household represented in this room. They are almost certainly not statues like coats of armor would be on in David's bedroom. Instead, they are the kind of idols that hide in the corner of your heart and that avoid detection. Some of those idols come in the form of dollar signs. Some come in the shape of self-image or self-advancement. Here's what idolatry in our hearts often looks like. Instead of finding hope in the Lord, we find hope in our retirement account. Instead of finding peace in Christ, we have it when our political party wins, and when we lose, we lose our peace. Instead of finding our joy in Jesus, we find our joy in mindless, godless, senseless entertainment. Instead of finding our contentment in the fact that God has saved us to be his children, instead we find contentment in personal ease or comfort. Instead of finding our value in what God has said to be true about us in Christ, we measure our value by our appearance or by some worldly measuring rod for success. Do you want to know one little verse that stumped me for a long time? I just didn't understand. How do I, how do I read this? It's 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. It's very simple. It just says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. You're probably thinking you're not a very good pastor if, you, if that stumps you. Well, here's why it stumps me. Because there are 105 verses in the book of 1 John. Idolatry is not mentioned in the first 104. This is the last verse of the entire book. He doesn't talk about idols one time. He doesn't discuss the subject of idolatry even in the slightest until he gets to the very last verse and he says to this church that he loves, little children, keep yourselves from idols. There is no context, there is no buildup, there is no explanation afterwards. That's his last breath. This is the sign-off of the book of 1 John to a group of believers. However, I think I've figured it out, at least a little bit. I think, I, I think it's important that we understand what the book of 1 John is about. He is writing a book to people saying... Here is how you know if you are believers. These are ways you know if you are in the faith. He provides test after test after test to reveal how you can have assurance of salvation. He speaks in stark terms. You are either light or you are darkness. You are life or you are death. You are a child of God or you are a child of devil, the devil. But then at the very end of the book, he drops this little line because he knows that whether or not you are a believer... Idols still sneak in. John speaks about Christians. You are little children. He's speaking about the ones who truly are saved. That does not mean this is a children's church lesson or a sticky note on a bigger letter. The bottom line of all of his message is this. He warns against idolatry because he knows that true Christians struggle with idolatry. There are idols all over this room right now. You don't have to go back to your bedroom to find them. They're here with you. There are divided hearts all over this room. There are ways that we have created things and put them in first place in our heart. Why did David have this idol in his room? Ultimately, I don't know, and I don't think any of us will really know until we get to heaven. But the more important question for you right now is what you do with the idols that are hiding in your heart. How do you get rid of them? One of the greatest things ever written about this subject in the English language is an article, or to be more precise, a pamphlet that was written by Thomas Chalmers in the early 1800s. Thomas Chalmers was a pastor before he was a Christian. He went into the ministry because he wanted some kind of advancement, and it was there, while he was living a life of hypocrisy, that he realized that, in fact, he must remove these sins and stop loving these sins and turn to Christ. And so he wrote this book, this pamphlet. It's 11 pages long. 
he writes it as a way of speaking about how the gospel truly grips the heart of a believer and transforms us. It's a little booklet that he calls The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. How do we go from loving sin to hating it? How do we go from loving our idols to destroying them? Through the expulsive power of new affection. Although the language in this pamphlet is somewhat challenging for modern readers, it truly is one of the best things that I have ever read. His argument simply boils down to this simple premise. Bondage to sin is broken by a stronger attraction, by a more compelling joy. If you want to stop loving your idols, then you need to start looking to something better, something stronger, something more satisfying and more joy-giving. In his article, Chalmers writes, the best way of casting out impure affection is to replace it with a pure one and by the love of what is good to expel the love of what is evil. Are you struggling with idolatry in your heart? What's the cure? Look to Jesus. See his glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 3.18 says, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Do you grasp what Paul is saying in that verse? Our spiritual transformation, our sanctification, our turning from who we were to looking more like Christ, every step of Christian growth occurs by beholding the glory of the Lord. When you see Jesus as he is, as true treasure, that's when idols lose their luster. When we behold the glory of the Lord in the gospel and in the scriptures, that is when we crush our idols into powder. We must We must look to Christ if we ever have any hope of getting those idols out of our bedroom. So I told you we're breaking this down into four pieces today. We've already looked at the plot, and now we've looked at the image. Now let's consider the lies that are told in this passage. Looking back at 1 Samuel chapter 19, did you notice that there were a number of blatant lies that were told by Michal, David's wife? She planned to deceive the messengers by putting the statue in the bed. She lied to them and she told them that David was just sick and he was just in that bed lying there. She lied to her father in this bizarre twist, blaming the entire thing on David. She lies. Now, this might be the most controversial point that I have ever made in any sermon ever. Lying is bad. Right? Can we agree? Lying is bad. A lying tongue is listed as one of the seven deadly sins in Proverbs chapter 6. Lying is bad. Proverbs 12, 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are a delight. Lying is bad. Jesus said in John 8, 44, you are of your father the devil, and you, your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Happy Father's Day. (laughs) Lying is bad. That's not controversial. However, this is where things do get a bit challenging and a bit controversial. You see, there are occasions in the Bible when God not only allows, but actually rewards somebody for telling a lie. Let me show you two examples. Start with Exodus chapter 1. The context is that Pharaoh has decided to kill all of the baby boys that are born to the Hebrew women so that they would effectively all become either married into the Egyptian bloodline or die out in one generation. So he commanded the Hebrew midwives, deliver these babies, and if any of them pops out and is a boy, you just kill it. These brave midwives conspired to reject Pharaoh's genocidal edict, and they continued to bring life into the world exactly as God intended. Exodus chapter 1 verse 17 tells us their reasoning. It simply says, But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. Now listen to how the situation plays out. Verse 18 says, So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. Now what do you call that? 
Well, aside from being a slap in the face to every woman that was Egyptian, it was also a lie. How does God respond to this lie that they told? Verse 20, so God dwell, dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Now, flash forward 121 years. The people of Israel have exited Egypt. They were just beginning to make their way into the land of, the prom of promise. And their very first stop is at a city called Jericho, the powerhouse city of the ancient world. Joshua sent two spies to go scope it out. And these two spies ended up in a boarding house or an inn on the wall that was owned and operated by a harlot named Rahab. Let's listen to how that story unfolds from Joshua chapter 2. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the, women, the woman who had taken the two men and hidden them, had taken the two men and hidden them, and she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up on the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. That's where we'll stop reading, but if you keep reading, she actually has a conversation with them afterwards telling them, the two spies, exactly why she did this. And she said, it's because we know what your God did to the Egyptians, and I fear your God. Again, what did she do? This is a lie. But listen to how the Bible speaks about these events. Hebrews 11, the chapter about the most powerful acts of faith in the entire Old Testament, says, By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. This entire event that unfolds in her household is described as a friendly welcome, and the opposite, the treatment that they received from everyone else in Jericho, is described as disobedience to God. In other words, if you contrast these two things, her actions were obedience to God. James chapter 2, verse 25, when speaking about this same event, and speaking about how true faith is always accompanied by actions of holiness, says, And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. She, James summarizes this whole event in this very short verse by saying this was an act of faith. The midwives and Rahab are both commended for what they did. And what they did was lie. But lying is bad. So why does he do this? How does this fit together? Let me first try to answer the question, why do people usually lie? Typically, it's for one of two reasons. It's either for self-preservation or self-advancement. It's a way to make ourselves appear greater than we are, or a way to tear someone else down and look, make them look worse than they are. It is a way that we attempt to keep ourselves from the consequences of our actions. In other words, we lie because we think that our personal needs are more important than speaking honestly. Here are three common threads that link the actions of the midwives and Rahab. First, they lied in order to protect the innocent. If they would have given the information, they would have been complicit in the murder of innocent people. Secondly, these lies were not told to defend themselves. We see many occasions where people are put on trial individually, standing for themselves, and they never are commended for giving a dishonest answer. If they were speaking in self-defense, they should have given an honest answer. These answers were given to help others. Lastly, and most importantly, they did what they did because they feared God. When you lie or you twist the truth or you deceive someone or you flatter someone, you are not doing so in a way that honors God. There are a million other motives that you might have in your heart, but they are not good motives 
because the motives that you have when you lie are not motives that are honoring to God. So, let me flash forward, not to our modern context, but let's just rewind 80 years from where we are now. Let's imagine that you were living in Germany in 1944, and you got a knock on your door at 4.30 in the morning, and an SS soldier asked you if there are any Jews hiding in your house. What should you say? You know that if you admit that your Jewish neighbors are now living in your attic, then they are immediately going to be rounded up and taken to the gas chambers or a concentration camp. Are you required by the scriptures to tell that soldier they are in your attic. I believe that passages like this one, the ones that I just presented to you, are here to show that God's desire is that we protect life in situations like these. So yes, you could, in a way that glorifies God, say to the SS officer, just like Bugs Bunny, which way did he go, George? Oh, he went that away. You could point any direction, and I think you could still honor God. So let me clarify. Do not walk out of church today and say, you know what the pastor taught me? He taught me that lying is just fine with God. No problem. <laughs> that is not an application point for you to take home. The likelihood is that you will probably never experience in your entire life a single occasion like the ones faced by Rahab or the midwives you will likely never encounter a scenario where you are able both to lie and to glorify God at the same time. And I'm encouraging you, don't look for such opportunities. You don't want those kinds of opportunities to knock on your door. Rather, seek to honor God through honesty. Psalm 34, 13, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Colossians chapter 3, 9, when Paul is giving this long list of ways to love each other in the church, he simply says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. You put off lying when you become a Christian, and you put on truth-telling. Don't lie. But with these things in mind, let's examine Michal's actions again in 1 Samuel 19. Michal lies. She attempts to deceive the messengers of Saul. She claims that David is just hanging out in bed because he's super sick. Now, I would argue that these actions are perfectly acceptable as a way to protect an innocent man, her own husband, from the unwarranted wrath of her father. She successfully allowed David to make a lot of tracks before Saul figured out what was going on. I would argue that is not only acceptable, but honorable. I think that this lie is a way that she could also glorify God. However, things with Michal take a wild turn when she comes face to face, face with her father. Look again at verse 17. Saul said to Michal, Why have you deceived me thus and let my enemy go so that he has escaped? And Michal answered Saul, He said to me, Let me go. Why should I kill you? In other words, it's as if David made up this plan and said, if you get in my way, you will be the first to die. Why would she say that? She certainly wasn't trying to protect someone else. This was self-defense. She was trying to save her own skin. There is no way that she could say these words to the glory of God. One of the reasons why I strongly encourage you not to look for opportunities to lie and at the same time honor God is because it seems to me like this example, if you begin speaking untruths, it might be hard for you to discern when it is actually honoring to God and when it is not. Even though Michal started off in a heroic way, this wicked kind of deception then undermines her entire plan. Think about it. Saul had legitimate reason now for hunting David down. This guy threatened my daughter. Happy Father's Day. If you have a daughter and somebody threatened her life, how do you think you would treat him? David, according to his own wife, had threatened her life. And so now has, Saul has seemingly plausible reason to go hunting him. Saul also used this event as an excuse to destroy David's marriage to Michal. That is why we read in 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 44, Saul had given Michal his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was of Galim. Her heroic actions might have saved her husband's life, yes, 
But her sinful lie guaranteed that David would be on the run for roughly 15 more years and that she herself would be passed along to another man like a teenager might trade Pokemon cards. Consider Jesus, the suffering servant. He is described in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 9 as having no deceit in his mouth. Even when he was paraded before six different illegal trials, Jesus never lied. He never made up a story. He never pointed the finger at anyone else. He never tried to defend himself. Michal gets in hot water. She stands before her father and says, it wasn't me, it was David. He even threatened my life. When Jesus was on trial, when his life was in the balance, he spoke the truth. In fact, earlier that night that he was betrayed, he said in John 17, 17, in what we call the high priestly prayer, he prayed, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Truth is a central concern for the believer. We should seek to know it and believe it and speak it. We have a Savior who is unlike us, one who has spoken truth in all circumstances. We have a Savior who never lied. Here's the fourth thing that I want you to take away from this sermon, the last one that we'll look at today, and that is the credit. And just like we saw last time in 1 Samuel, David's mindset is not put on display in our text in 1 Samuel. We don't see it here on this page. Rather, we find out exactly what David was thinking because while these events were unfolding, he was writing poems about it. He wrote in the book of Psalms about this. Earlier, earlier, Francesco read so well for us from Psalm chapter 59. I want you to go ahead and turn there in your Bible. We're going to be there for the rest of our time together. Just go ahead and flip over to Psalm chapter 59. And when you do, I want you to pay very close attention to the superscript at the top, which tells us the exact occasion upon which this was written. Here's what it says. To the choir master... According to Do Not Destroy, a mitchem of David, when Saul sent men to watch his house in order to kill him. This is what David was thinking, what he was praying, what he was writing, what he was singing as those soldiers were surrounding his house, as that rope was lowered out his window, as he was running away to the hills. This is what David had in his heart. This opening to the psalm is a note to the choir master. It tells them what tune to play and what style to sing. But the focus here is on the fact that this was occurring during the exact same events of 1 Samuel 19. Now, there's a number of things that we could consider from Psalm 59. It is a beautiful, masterful, incredible psalm. But for now, to close out this sermon, I want to draw your attention to simply one of them. And that is basically this. Who gets the credit for David's survival? Michal is the one who came up with that scheme to get him out the window. And David was probably already long gone when she decided to put the statue in his place, so he probably didn't know those details when he wrote the story, this psalm. But did you notice that David doesn't actually give any credit to Michal at all? He doesn't mention her name. He doesn't speak of her. He doesn't view her as the reason for his escape. Now, certainly, she did have a piece to play, but he gives all credit to God. I want you to look at verses 9 and 10. It says this, O oh my strength. In your Bible, you will probably see that that word strength is capitalized because it is a way of speaking of God himself. It is a name of God. You, God, are my strength. Any muscles that I have in my body, I don't give them credit for my help or my escape. You are my strength. I will watch for you. For you, O oh God, are my fortress, my God in his steadfast love will meet me. God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. Now take your finger and just jump down to verse 16. And there we read, But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been a fortress for me and a refuge in the day of my distress. Oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you. For you, oh God, are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. Did you notice that three times in this chapter, David refers to the Lord as his fortress? David's running into the middle of the woods, but he has a powerful fortress to protect him. This imagery is very important. He has 
been delivered in this chapter by the rhetoric of his friend Jonathan and by the cunning of his wife, and even in between by his own athleticism in running from Saul. But David rightly understood that the real reason behind his safety all boiled down to the fact that God was protecting him, that God was his fortress. And as verse 17 shows, David recognized that this metaphor of God as his fortress is not displayed as some random house that I could just walk into that is dispassionate towards me. Your house doesn't care whether you're in it or not. Your house doesn't have feelings at all. But God certainly does. And God loved David. He speaks of God's steadfast love on four separate occasions. That word for covenant love has said, David understood that if God is for me, who can be against me? The gospel does not promise you that you will never suffer. David certainly suffered. He lost his home. He lost his wife. He was functionally exiled into the wilderness at this point. The gospel does not come with a promise that you will always be healthy or that you will always be wealthy or that you will live a long life. Stephen was a man who was young, who was dragged out of the synagogue to be stoned to death as the very first martyr of the Christian church. We are not promised earthly things, even earthly protection. But the gospel does promise that the Lord always delivers his people. This is a promise that idolaters like you and me and like David have from the Lord, that even though we have turned away from him and we have sent our hearts love towards worthless things, lesser things, Jesus came to die for idolaters. He died to make us his children. He died so that he might set his steadfast love upon us. Because we are his children, he is a mobile fortress that moves with us wherever we go, even into the grave itself. Whatever experiences the Lord gives us to walk through, that God, he is going to go with us. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. This reality was so potent in David's life that even in the midst of being hunted by Saul, he was able to sing of God's strength and to sing of God's steadfast love. Even in the face of impending doom, David could raise his voice in triumphant song because he knew God truly was his fortress. And the Lord is a fortress for all who come to him in faith for forgiveness of sins. If you are in Christ, you have no need to fear anything. No need to fear that boss. No need to fear that doctor's report. No need to fear anything that is going on in your household. No need to fear if you are walking in accordance with his will. You need to know that he is your shield. He is your strength. He is your fortress. So if you're paying close attention, today's sermon really boils down to two things, satisfaction and safety. Both are found in Jesus Christ alone. If you don't know the Lord, stop looking for satisfaction in the things of the world because just like going out to the ocean and seeing the salt water, sure, it looks like it will quench your thirst, but if you drink it, you're just going to die. Stop looking for safety from the world. Your greatest enemies, sin and death, you have no weapons to fight against them apart from Christ. If you don't know the Lord, you need to look to Jesus, the one who died and rose again because that is where we true find true satisfaction, and that is where we find true safety. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for this story of deliverance, this story of how you, by your grace, allowed David to live so that he would one day rule over that nation. Well, Lord, I thank you also that you sent your son, the Messiah, Jesus, who gave up his life, who allowed himself to be captured, who allowed himself to go to the cross so that he might give his life for us. Lord, we pray that we would look to him, that we would look to Jesus Christ, our source of satisfaction, our source of joy, so that we might expel all idols from our lives. And also, Lord, I pray that we would look to him for our safety, that we would not view our own means as our strength, but we would look only to Jesus Christ. It's in his precious name that we pray. Amen.